Hi, Simon. We've got you here today as the new head of Wine GB, and you're in charge of a very important industry to us all. But I thought before we jumped into that and your plans for the future and where you see everything heading off, you could fill us in a little bit on your career and what led you to becoming an MW. Uh, hi. Yes. Hi, Guy. Well, I've, uh, I've been uh, now quite frighteningly 32 or 33 years in the, in the wine industry, man and boy. Uh, I joined uh, straight out of university, actually, mainly because I, I um, not that I had a, 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 any uh, kind of background in wine other than enjoying um, holidays with my parents in France, but um, uh, mainly because I thought food and wine, um, or food and drink, actually, were, 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 was quite a cool thing to do. And I didn't know at the, at the time there wasn't really a food industry to, to, you know, there was a food industry, but careers in food were mainly about sort of technical jobs or production. Um, and the whole world of chefs and, uh, and the like didn't really, the hours didn't appeal to me, I don't think. <laughs> so wine seemed like, <laughs> wine seemed like a, good, a good option. Uh, and, I, and I started off, I, I was lucky enough to, to fall on my feet. I, I found a, a great job working at Fortnum and Mason, actually, in London, selling very nice wine in general to, to, um, to rich people. Kind of evolved from there. So I, so I spent seven or eight years there, um, did my WSET, um, uh, courses there, uh, and then um, and then started the MW uh, actually when I was at Fortnum's, and uh, realised pretty quickly that I wouldn't have uh, much chance of passing it without a better understanding of how wine was actually made. You know, I'd been lucky enough to go and taste lots of good wines, but um, but that was very old world dominated and um, and very much a sort of luxury end. So so the business and the production for uh, at a more at a, at, a, at a larger scale and a more, maybe perhaps more commercial scale was was um, was not really very well known to me. Um, so went off travelling with my wife. Um, well, we got married and then went off travelling, made some made wine around the world in California, Australia, visited lots of the New World countries, and came back and 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 very luckily got a job at Waitrose in the buying team. That was a real serendipitous moment, um, uh, and and had a fantastic time. Uh, in the buying team for Waitrose and passed my MW whilst I was there um, now, a long time ago, 1997. And since then, um, have have been doing various jobs in in importing, distribution, quality management, uh, marketing. Um, and latterly, uh, before joining WineGB, I was um, I ran uh, the UK and Europe office for Negotiants UK, which was an Australian owned or the subsidiary of an Australian wine company, but the Alamba Wine Company. So that that was um, you know really cool. Left there and joined joined Wine GB um, about fifteen months ago now uh, as the as the CEO, the first I think full time CEO, um, and have um, feet haven't touched the ground since. Really, it's been uh, it's been a real whirlwind and and very exciting and very interesting job. It is a great time to be involved in wine in general, particularly English wine. Before we delve into that, I just wanted to pick up on what you were saying about your career when you went to Australia. Which particular regions did you go around and have fun exploring? Well, uh, we were in uh, sorry, we were in Australia for about a year actually altogether, um, and um, some of it was it was a honeymoon after all, you know. So, so um, <laughs> uh, still living on the credit. Uh, but um, but we spent um, we actually went to pretty much all of the production the main producing regions but but had uh, had work at vintage time in the uh, Hunter Valley in the olden days when when the Upper Hunter Valley which was where Rosemount were based and they had a, a fantastic vineyard Chardonnay vineyard called Roxburgh um, up up uh, in a near a town called Denman. Uh, so I worked up there for a while with a with a great winemaker um, called Phil Shaw, who's still around, but not not with um, not with uh, Rosemans anymore. So I did that, and then I, I worked uh, full vintage at um, at Chateau Tabelk, which is in um, the uh, Golden River uh, area, Golden Valley, which is about a hundred kilometres, I think, north of of Melbourne in Victoria, and and that was that was an amazing experience. Actually, it was probably three or four months worth of work. Um, a few of us, very few of us working vintage. It was extremely hard work, but I haven't been as fit as that in a long time, nor have I drunk as much, nor have I ever drunk as much beer. But it was brilliant because you had very traditional red wine making, so open top fermenters, punching down and pump overs and, and the like. 
but also very modern white wine making. So, so you know, the, the, you had the kind of best of both worlds. Really good, um, you know, really good from a learning perspective because we were a small team, and effectively, I got I was able to get involved in in all sorts of different roles within the within the vintage work. So, so um, yeah, it was it was fantastic from a from a learning perspective and from an understanding of how a winery works. You know, it was it was invaluable, I have to say. And and but but also the contacts that you make when you're doing that sort of trip. Uh, you know, we met lots of people. We, we started in California. We met lots of people in California that we then were able to hook up with around the world as we carried on our travels. Um, and 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 you know that sort of network is. I'm sure it's not unique to the wine industry, but but it was. Um, you know, re- really quite extraordinary how much welcome we were given by very very many people around the world. That's great. I mean, especially considering that the regions that you're mentioning are what are now considered as new world wine regions or Australia. Have you noticed any key uh, similarities between those and where the English wine industry is? Because obviously we're even newer in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, do you know what I think is one of the things that really characterises the English wine scene, English and Welsh wine scene, is, is this kind of openness to innovation and you know, willingness to try stuff. Uh, um, and also always looking to improve. So, so you know, and I think yeah, it, it's it's too um, simplistic. I think to to generalise that that you know old world equals this and new world equals that. But Absolutely. certainly, you'd, you'd, you'd suggest that that there's a greater um, you know a, maybe it's a greater opportunity uh, to 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 um, to innovate, to try new things, uh, to push the boundaries of style, and to be open minded about about those those sorts of things the one of the real attributes or the uh, um, real key positives about the industry here is that, that there's so much understanding because of where we are and so many people have worked a bit like myself actually worked importing or developing brands and working with winemakers from around the world for for sale into this market so so many of the people that that, that you see have have experienced have had an experience of working with with wines from around the world and winemakers from around the world, that I think it makes us very open to ideas, to concepts, but, you know, not so much a closed mind, this is the way you do it, and, and you know, you must not deviate from this path. Uh, it's definitely a, a, a real facet, a real positive facet, I think, to the industry. In. I completely agree. One of the, you could argue, limitations of a lot of the appellation rules, and particularly within France, they're very strict on great varieties for the regions, the volumes, output, and so forth. And yet here we are, a new world wine region. The winemakers are free to experiment pretty much as much as they want. Yeah. Have you noticed that to be a ben- a, of benefit yet? Yeah, I know. Listen, I think and it's very pertinent, actually, because we, as Wine GB, we're looking at, uh, with, a, with a group of, of other people from the industry, um, uh, we've been assessing the current regulations that we have in this country in terms of the PDOs and the PGIs and, and the like. Oh. Um, because because actually a consequence of, of of leaving the European Union means that now we, we have that an, an opportunity to adjust things should we see fit. So we've been we've been looking at, at what might be um you know ways of developing it. You know, it's a process. You know, one has to consult very broadly on this sort of thing because the because the rules affect everybody um, who's making wine in this country and and selling it to an extent, so so you know it's very it's a it's a process, but 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 you know one of the things that becomes obvious in in that in that thought process or that thinking is that you know what we what we really don't want to do is put any constraints, any boxes around those around the around the winemakers, uh, because because you know we are a young, very young industry, lots of um, you know planting, lots of lots of growth, lots of new ideas. We, you know, what's good now, good grapes might come from somewhere else in 10, 15, 20 years time. We, we don't know. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, why would you try to control or legislate for something that might happen, might not happen? Uh, and, and so therefore, you know, you need to, I think we feel that they, we need to create a framework which assures a, a, min, a minimum level of quality. Um, and, and, you know, I think everybody would have an aspiration that, that overall levels of quality will, will increase gradually and you know, continual sort of improvements, whether they be in the, in the world-class sparkling wines that we already make or, or, or for, for the still wines from different grape varieties or whatever it may be. 
but you know, so so as long as we can kind of look to shore up the the uh, a minimum level of quality assurance for the consumer, then then you certainly wouldn't want to put too many constraints around it. And I think you know, there's a there are quite a lot of um, there's quite a lot of discourse around the world around you know of, as to what the purpose or benefits or objectives of a of a of a GI ge- geographical indication scheme might be. Uh, certainly, the you know ge- the actual linking quality to place is n- not really something that that we should be uh, i don't think we should be trying to trying to put in place very in the near future let's say because there's just so much we don't know about that about the vineyards that that, that we grow you know about place best places for the vines etc cetera, etc cetera. And, and things are evolving so quickly as we as we go as well so so yeah it's but it's a great and very interesting and philosophical as well as as well as practical debate Absolutely. And as you say, we are developing at a rapid rate. There is a lot of freedom for winemakers to experiment with all these different yeasts, all these different varieties where they wouldn't necessarily be allowed to. What do you think the hurdles are that we we have as an industry? You know, what challenges do you think there is? Well, I think we do have challenges and a lot of it is around that the sort of unknown uh, or the high levels of volatility we get in yield from one year to the next. You know, yeah. the, the difference between 2018, uh, when we had the equivalent of, I think, just over 13 million bottles were produced. Uh, you know, that, that, that's actually, even though there are more vineyards, that's actually come down over the last uh, three three vintages. 19, 20, 21 have been more around 9 or 10 million bottles Um if you're if you're on the commercial end of that and trying to manage growth because we've got growth in sales, so uh, you know very strong numbers um, uh, at the moment. So so which is which is fantastic and a, a really positive sign from a from a consumer engagement perspective. The the other were mentally sustainable uh, or, or you know, have have the best possible environmental practices in a climate which is you know, pretty quite often unhelpful for growing grapes and therefore, you know, that balance between um, non-interventionist or, or, or non-chemical-based um, uh, viticulture to, to, um, to, to that which is practical. I think there's a, there's a balance to be had there. You know, we have to be, a, we have to be conscious of, of growing uh, a viable crop um, as well as well. otherwise there's no, there's no industry to protect or there's no land to protect if, we, if, we, if we're not careful. So I think those are two two key areas, um, and then and then also you know from a, from a kind of industry perspective, I think what we've got to think is is long term. We we mustn't make decisions based on on this year or next year particularly, um, but but uh, we have to, we have to think about about the long term. There are other elements ar- around this. You know, we want to, um, we've, we've got to be able to find um, uh, uh, solutions to the labour shortage that there has been in the last two vintages. I think we've, you know, the viticulture for the first time has been um, is, is one of the uh, eligible industries for for the seasonal agricultural worker scheme. That's a new thing for this year, which is great news. How we access that and how we um, make sure that they're shared. Uh, around effectively amongst the amongst the wine producing vine- amongst the vineyards is is re- is really uh, crucial. Again, this is the first the first year really that that there's been access to this, and that might mean some slight changes in the in the interaction between the between the contractors and that labour force. Uh, but but you know it's something that we'll look to to learn and and um, and help to facilitate as much as possible. So, so there's a number of challenges, but but you know the overall picture, as you said at the beginning, it's a very exciting, very exciting industry and a very exciting time to be in it. In terms of the labour force, are you talking about uh, people coming over from Europe to help at the busy times? Yeah, pr- primarily. Yeah, so that's where the majority of, of vineyard workers uh, comes from from uh, Eastern Europe, or has historically come from Eastern Europe. So there's been um. Uh, fewer, fewer of them um, in the last two years, you know, driven by a combination of uh, COVID uh, restrictions as well as as well as, um, as, well as uh, so Brexit and the and the changes in visa requirements. So so and it's a little bit the re- you know on a small scale a replication of the of the challenges that hospitality and and um, uh, supply chain warehousing and delivery drivers those sorts of things. So so the agricultural sector has been has been quite badly hit by that. And uh, now the government has recognised that viticultural requirements, the same, you know, in, in the same way that other fruit picking, uh, you know, is affected uh, by by that. Now, 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 you know, they've 
there's an understanding that we need to be able to access these workers um, and and therefore this seasonal agricultural workers scheme uh, should allow there to be enough enough um, labor for those times and and you know it's not just harvest it's pruning um and it, and some of the work between uh you know vineyard work between between that you know that whole pruning to harvest end of harvest period and you know it's it, it, there will be an increase i think in technical technological solutions so i think there'll be more mechanical harvesting and you see all sorts of wonderful machines that go up and down the the rows of vines in different parts of the world um yeah, where he's doing some of that replacing some of the um some of the uh, activities that is normally done by um by hand we have to be conscious that the quality um you know if you want to op- absolutely optimize quality you can't you can't do everything um, by hand that's uh, right you can't do everything by machine you have to you have to hand harvest some fruit without doubt you you also have to um you know have very accurate pruning um and canopy management as well so so it's um you know it's a it's a balance but i think some of that some of that shortage um, will be alleviated uh, this year because of these new changes. Well, and it's a, a good thing, or rather an interesting point that you raised there about uh, having the pickets, because that's an incredibly busy time of year. And there are certain parts within um, Europe, due to the Appalachian rules, where they have to be hand harvested and they can't use mm-hmm. machines. And if we're able to bring over or rather have more labour, do you see that as a general boost for the industry in a very good thing because the quality might be better for example with grape selection yeah well i think if, if you think about some of the wines or the grapes that are the, and, oh, well the may, way that sparkling wine is made you have to avoid skin contact at a certain point so so you know machine, machine harvesting is not is not really um an, an, the answer for 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 all for all sparkling wine production i think it, you know it can be used and 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 the the the, the development of machine harvesters is, is is extraordinary actually over the over the years so um so so you know there's a lot more finesse around around that so so it may be that 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 is a solution which can be used for everything but but even then you know there's a lot of small vineyards here um and 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 generally um from a from an efficiency and a cost efficiency perspective, um, machine harvesting is much better in in larger vineyards, much more much more efficient. My sense is that you know, def- we, we definitely will require la- uh, labour. Um, um, can't can't get away from that, and, and especially at harvest time and pruning time. So so um, so being able to have access, uh, more access, or continued access is 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 really important, and and. Um, you know, that's um, we, we we have to work on that um, on that basis. Uh, I can't see that. You know, you never say never, but doing away entirely with with um, vineyard workers for those sorts of um, activities, uh, you know, this may be a long way off. Yeah, and and as you say, there's certain times when a vast amount of labour is needed, and and you have a short window to do that. So it's it's an influx of people that's required. Mm. Um, and as you say, it would be best if we could make that easier. But we'll have to wait and see. Yeah, and well, I think one of the challenges is around the fact that the, the people that have worked several vintages or several years of, you know, especially in pruning, in fact, you know, if you're a good pruner, um, you know what you, you know, being particularly well, you know, directed as well, this is what we want to require, you know, those, there's, you're much faster when you know what you're doing and you've done it before and, you, you know, that, so there's a sort of semi-skilled element to this, which is, which is, um, which is important to bear in mind. So, so you know, it's definitely it's best to have people that have had some some experience of working in vineyards um, and be able to use them year after year and whether that's going to be feasible in this with the new scheme with the new seasonal worker scheme is um is, is a little bit up in the air at the moment i guess do you think that the industry should have a focus on just producing sparkling wines like, do, do you think it would be better if if the English wine industry was known for producing just continually well beating sparkling wines so rather than having a percentage of stills. Uh, no. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, this is probably a, you know, a personal view as much as a, as much as anything else. You know, I think I think the world of wine is so exciting uh, and so engaging because of the variety um, that that it produces and. Uh, you know, we have we have um, we have as an industry gained a wonderful reputation, growing reputation uh, for the quality of the sparkling wines that we make. 
Um, but uh, you know, I, it, it really isn't a surprise that that uh, that the winemakers are, are saying, "Oh, let's try and make a Chardonnay or a Pinot or, or, or you know a good Bacchus, or let's see what these new Peewee varieties will do for us." And um, and uh, and you know, why would anybody ever want to to put any limit on that sort of on that sort of uh, ambition? I, I you know, and there's some great wines coming. You know, early, again, early days, but there's some really really good wines that are being made. Especially, in, you know, we, we just need the, the, the climate um, to be consistently a little bit more more delivering good ripeness uh, year, year after year. But, but my goodness, you know, what, why? I, th- I think we, we could. Who, kn- who knows? Who knows where it's going? In ten years' time, we might be making as much still wine as we are sparkling, and it could be brilliant, 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 and and gaining reputation ar- around the world. I suppose the one thing to bear in mind in all this is that at the moment it's not a cheap place to make uh, to make wine to grow grapes the yields are very low um and and therefore you know that that pushes up um the the, the cost or the or the selling prices of the wine so, so they've got to be good to be able to uh, to justify those those um those prices and make sure that the consumer as more and more consumers get into english and welsh wine they you know they 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 you have to you have to earn trust of consumers in, in my mind so they so have to deliver a quality um and and price um equilibrium or over deliver on quality um and and you know as we mature as that relationship with the consumer in this country especially becomes more uh, evolved and more engaged then, then you know you will get more consumers into our category, still and sparkling, who are less used to spending the sorts of amounts of money that we that the wines are, are fetching at the moment. So that's uh, those are that's the that's a kind of community of consumers who who we really have to work um, to maintain their their trust and their their engagement in the category. So so um, so I think that's that's an important that's an important element uh, as as we go forward but wow you know i mean there's all sorts of different ways that this industry can go you know who would have thought that that the crouch valley would be making you know really really ripe pinots and chardonnays um you know, that's that's great where's where next you know what I mean, that's one of those as a wine enthusiast you kind of think wow fantastic let's um you know how, how's it going to evolve where, where's it going uh, r- rose r- english rose at the moment um is uh, you know i don't think i think if you if you spoke to most producers of rosa they just sold out so quickly last year um need more need to be able to make more um and uh, and there's such a demand for it i keep using this um this sort of catchphrase that that you, re- you really don't need to go to the south of france to get good rosé um you know just go, <laughs> just go just just go around the corner but you know there's great rosés being made all over the place and um uh, so yeah, very exciting. You mentioned it briefly earlier about the issues with workforce uh, at certain times of the year. But what about the issues with wine supply in general? Because a lot of vineyards do sell out just because we simply don't have enough wine, and as exports increase and greater awareness increases, these are all wonderful things for our industry. But we need to have the wines. We need to be able to supply or, or the demand. How do you see us uh, approaching that bigger picture, should we say? Yeah, well, it's um, again, it's a sign of the of the early stages or the early years that we're in as an industry, as a serious commercial industry. That that, um, that balance between supply and demand is quite hard to manage uh, at the moment. And, uh, and you know, it wasn't long ago when there was a, a, a concern that there was going to be a you know way too much wine. How how will we be able to manage um, to maintain premium prices if, if there was a lot of wine around that, that needed a needed to find a home. Uh, we, we, it feels a little bit like we're a long way from that at the moment. But uh, but you know if we have uh, two or three bumper crops, then then that might come back onto the agenda. That being said, you know we have a there's particular market dynamics in the last couple of years which have really helped to grow uh, that engagement um, with the consumer in this country, especially. Uh, you know, lack of international travel, um, the, the 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 desire to buy local, a, a real desire to get to know people that are producing those things that you put in your in your body, you know, whether it be food or wine, 
or, or drink. So, so you know, there are a lot of market dynamics have, have played into our uh, it's played to our favour. I think uh, um, over the last couple of years, or three or four years. So, so that you know, and it's a sh- it would be a shame, I, I think, in order not if we weren't able to fulfil that um, you know that demand. Um, and and uh, you know that it's quite hard to control that. You know, and and you know, each individual producer will will have a, a task on their hands to be able to forecast sales growth and to uh, try to be able to match um to be try, try to be able to match production in order to be able to to to, to supply that demand uh, and that's and that's even more difficult when you're making sparkling wine which is going to be um aged for two three four years before before it gets released you know, you're having to think a long way ahead and how you know do i you know demand is incredibly strong at the moment uh, will it be maintained in four years' time if I make, you know, if I if I ferment, um, you know, double the amount of wine this year, or something? If you could get hold of the grapes, so so you know, this really complex issue around around supply and demand planning, um, and uh, you know, I'm I don't have to do it myself, so I'm uh, I'm kind of quite happily out of that for this purpose. But but you know, you can see you can see that that's a challenge. The other thing that we don't have hugely well developed here is this sort of internal market for trading between producers so so i i think that'll that that's that'll be important because you imagine you you have um you have some brands or some wineries where the sales are, are going gangbusters and um and they might not have all the production that they need um and other, other people might have made more than they actually need so so a, a good way a, a slick way of trading between producers uh, trading of sewer lap sparkling wine for example or or a grape marketplace or, or you know those sorts of mechanisms I, I think that's a that's an interesting um and, and quite important element of how the industry will evolve going forward but yeah i mean it would it's um it's a you know we're not at the stage where we where we don't have enough wine at all yet uh, but 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 making sure you know having the wine in the right place at the at the right time for the right customer is is uh is is, is really important but, but you know there's so much headroom still in terms of um the market opportunity in this country there's there's um there's still i don't know how many it would be in the in the main four supermarkets there's probably I don't know, 10 times as many champagnes on the shelf as there are English sparkling wines, for example. Um, you know, so so if we're able to to grasp some of that, um, some of that um shelf space for 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 English and Welsh wines, then then that'll be, you know, that will increase uh, demand. Yeah. On trade to on trade is a big area of opportunity. Uh, you know, wouldn't it be if you go to you go to Cape Town or you go to San Francisco or Sydney or Melbourne uh, or Adelaide, you know, you you go and you see you know the the wine lists of in the in the on trade or the or the um well in the on trade overall you know dominated by the local wines so uh you know we're a long 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 way from that in this country and um you know there's a lot of opportunity there which can be developed over the years it's not gonna you can't turn it on overnight but but you know it would be it would be great if that if that sort of um you know that that sort of uh, emphasis on local wines could be um could be uh could be replicated in 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 the marketplace in the in the on trade here not just in london but you know in the whole country of course do you, do you think another route to helping people be more aware of english wine slightly uh, contradicting what you were saying is perhaps to have uh, fewer wines out there so in other words we've got all these producers and it's great everybody's putting so much effort into making uh, all these different wines and these different brands, but perhaps it would be better to have a consolidation of that to have more wines available in terms of the individual supplies. Yeah, I think I think that'll come. It's a sort of natural outcome, really, of of uh, the evolution of the industry. So, so, I mean, you could draw some some parallels with uh, California, uh, uh, where um, where you know when it when when the industry over there in the Napa was was started, you had um, you had lots of, of smaller producers um, uh, selling locally, um, and, and uh, gra- gradually, gradually, there's been a sort of um, corporatization almost. I mean, we've still got a lot, a lot of smaller producers, but but um, but a lot of the larger ones have been um, 
have been either kind of integrated into other portfolios or, or there's been some consolidation or, or larger um, larger uh, corporations have bought into those. And, and you kind of imagine that in, in time that that, that, that is, a, is an evolutionary development for, for, for the industry here. But, but I think we're fair, fair way from it at the moment. I, 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 don't, I, I see a point about, you know, there needs to be enough wine for producers to be able to supply Tesco's, you know, and to be able to have a full program of, of promotional activity. And, um, uh, you know, all wine in, in uh, the supermarkets has, to, um, has to, to, to merit its place on the shelf. You know, it's, uh, it's one of the sort of economic transactions that takes place. But, but um, so, so I think, you know, I, I, I sense that you'll get that, coming i mean it's already in place you know there's some big producers who are able to do that already um and i think they'll probably gra- gradually become more and more of those i mean it does also you know it's great to be discussing this because you know how might things evolve we we don't we don't really know but right. um, but but you know that you would imagine that the negotiant type um type um, brand might might evolve where you'd get um you know you buy stock um, that's that might be sitting short, especially on sparkling wine. I'm talking about here rather than still wine. But but um, you know, if there's a lot of wine sitting on surlap somewhere uh, or in different places, then then this brand that might have access to the supermarket shelves would want to buy into that to be able to continue supply. But we're just not quite just quite there yet. There's, you know, there's uh, that that um, that stock availability surlap just doesn't exist at the moment, and. Um, and uh, people are people are generally building their own uh, their own inventory uh, in order to be able to um, in order to be able to work on that basis. But but when you look at the growth in plantings that there's been, um, and therefore the the increase in production that that there should be on an, in normal vintage um, uh, conditions, then then that will come. And and then you know then producers will be able to take advantage of the opportunities that are there. Um, with those with those larger retailers, both both on and off trade, and so so you know big uh, big on trade uh, groups uh, as as much as as much as the larger supermarkets. This is the end of part one. The second half of the interview can be listened to in the next podcast.